Good morning. Welcome to God's house. Happy to have you all here this morning. We've reached the final Sunday in the season of Epiphany, which every year we celebrate as the transfiguration of our Lord. This morning we're especially going to focus on what our Lord wants us to see and learn up on that Mount of Transfiguration and what he wants to take with us down that mountain as we enter the season of Lent. So that will be the focus of our worship this morning. Please join in singing our first hymn, hymn number 79.
Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve Him as His dear children, but we have disobeyed Him and deserve only His wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to Him and plead for His mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you, and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, He has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Let us pray. O God, in the glorious transfiguration of your only begotten Son, you confirmed the mysteries of the faith by the testimony of Moses and Elijah. And in the voice that came from the bright cloud, you foreshadowed our adoption as your sons. In your mercy, make us co-heirs of glory with Jesus our King, and bring us at last to heaven. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. first lesson for this, the transfiguration of our Lord, comes to us from the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. In fact, these words are the very last words of the Old Testament. The last words of God to His people for over 400 years. That, that 400 years was kind of like the, the, the pause in a movie before the, the climax, before something big is going to happen. And these words are the words that the Lord wanted echoing in His people's ears throughout that time period. They're the things that he wanted them to remember the most. He brings up the law of Moses. He wants them to remember that he gave them that law as, as a chaperone, as a guide to, to, to lead them to thirst for a Savior, to, to show them that they couldn't get to salvation by obeying the law. He, he promises to send Elijah, who will turn their hearts, who will lead them to repent, a, a foreshadow of John the Baptist, he tells them that the great and terrible day of the Lord is coming, Judgment Day. And so all of these things were designed to, to prepare the people of Israel for the coming of the Savior. Look, the day is coming, burning like a blast furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. The day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord of armies. A day that will not leave behind a root or branch for them. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise, and there will be healing in its wings. You will go out and jump around like calves from the stall. You will trample the wicked. They will surely be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I take action, says the Lord of armies. Remember the law of my servant Moses, which I commanded to him at Horeb to serve as statutes and judgments over all Israel. 
Look, I am going to send Elijah the prophet to you before the great and fearful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with complete destruction. This is the word of the Lord. Please join in singing our psalm of the day. It's Psalm 2, found on page 65. Our second lesson comes to us from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 3, beginning at verse 7. On the Mount of Transfiguration, we have the Old Testament and the New. We have Moses and Elijah, and we have Jesus. We have the law, the Old Testament law, and the New Testament gospel, and a comparison and contrast between the two. And that's really what Paul is spelling out for us in these words in 2 Corinthians. He's comparing the ministry of the law, the ministry of Moses, and the ministry of the Spirit, the Gospel. Now you know as Lutherans that we hold the Gospel in predominance, and rightly so because it is the only thing that can save us. But sometimes that leads us to be accused of of having no regard or no use for the law, that maybe even the law is bad. Far from it. As Paul says, the law has a glory of its own, but sadly to many, The glory of the law is veiled. They don't understand the true glory of the law. They see the law instead as a means to salvation, a ladder that you can climb up to heaven. And it can never be that. It can never save. But in Christ, the the veil is removed from the law. We see the glory of the law properly. We see that it, it leads us to the Gospel by killing us, by showing us that we cannot save ourselves. It leads us to Jesus. And only in Jesus do we see the true glory of both the law and the gospel, and that message 
is transformative to us. The same word that is, is used for the transfiguration of our Lord is used in the last verse of our text here. We are being transformed by that combination of law and gospel to be ever more like our Savior. Paul writes, If the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look directly at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face, though it was fading, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be much more glorious? For if the ministry that brought condemnation has glory, the ministry that brought righteousness has even more glory. In fact, in this case, what was glorious is no longer very glorious because of the greater glory of that which surpasses it. Indeed, if what is fading away was glorious, how much more glorious is that which is permanent? Therefore, since we have this kind of hope, we act with great boldness. We are not like Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites could not continue to look at the end of the radiance as it was fading away. In spite of this, their minds were hardened. Yes, up to the present day, the same veil remains when the Old Testament is read. It has not been removed because it is taken away only in Christ. Instead, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. But all of us who reflect the Lord's glory with an unveiled face are being transformed into His own image, from one degree of glory to another. This, too, is from the Lord, who is the Spirit. This is the Word of the Lord. Please join in singing our next hymn. It's hymn number 96.
Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. We read Mark's account of the transfiguration from chapter 9, beginning at verse 2. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were alone by themselves. There he was transfigured in front of them. His clothes became radiant, dazzling white, whiter than anyone on earth could bleach them. And Elijah appeared to them together with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say because they were terrified. A cloud appeared and overshadowed them, and a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the gospel of our Lord, we pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Dear fellow redeemed friends in Christ Jesus, who is the Son of God, the Son he loves. If you've ever been on a road trip, you know that you occasionally run into road signs that give you some fairly urgent-sounding advice. For example, if you're traveling through the upper Midwest at this time of year, you may come across a sign on the interstate that says, Road Closed Ahead, Turn Around Here. If you're headed south into Illinois, you come across a sign that says, This is the last free exit before you hit the tollway. So if, if you don't want to have to pay to drive any further, you've got to get off here. You might see a sign that says last rest stop for 90-some miles, so if you have to go, you better go now. If you are coming to a very barren section of the highway, you may come to a sign that says last stop for gas, and if you're running low, you better fill up so you're ready for the rest of your adventure. If we can see the Christian church here as a road trip, then Transfiguration is kind of a sign, a sign that tells us to, to stop, to pause, to, to take things in, to learn things before we move on into the next season of the church here, the season of Lent. Why? Why does Jesus want us to stop on this mountaintop? Why do we see Moses and Elijah there with him, those great legends from the Old Testament, the representative of the law and the prophets, respectively. Well, there's no doubt that there are some very interesting things revealed to us here that are probably not revealed to us anywhere else in Scripture. We see Moses and Elijah here. They're alive. It tells us that you don't when you die, you don't live in some bodiless existence until the last days. There's no such thing as a soul sleep, that, that false teaching of the Jehovah's Witnesses and others, that when you die, you, you just fall into a sort of unconsciousness until the last day. Moses, who, was, who died and was buried by the Lord, and Elijah, who was swept by the Lord up to heaven in a whirlwind, they're both here. They are both fully conscious, conscious they are both alive. What we're seeing here is a glimpse of heaven, a taste of what heaven is like. Jesus is transfigured before the eyes of the disciples, and Moses and Elijah get to talk to him face to face. That's what heaven is, being in the presence of God, able to view Jesus in all of his glory, being able to talk to him like a friend. We get a vision here of of what heaven is like for the believers who have gone before us already, for your loved ones. You don't need to mourn for them. You might want to be jealous of them because this is the life that they are experiencing right now. This this is the life that we are looking forward to enjoy in the future. But again, why, why now? Why right before Jesus is about to begin that terrible road to the cross are Moses and Elijah here? 
Now here's what's interesting, I think, about the Mount of Transfiguration, is that you're up on this mountain, and it, it allows you to see kind of a vista view, an overview of everything. It, it's kind of the, the hinge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. I, I almost view it as, as Moses and Elijah showing up to pass the baton off to Jesus, who will descend that mountain and complete his mission. And I think in a sense, then, it takes us back to, to look at where the Old Testament ended. Right? That's what we heard in the, the words of Malachi. Remember the law of my servant Moses, which I commanded to him at Horeb to serve as statutes and judgments over all Israel. Look, I'm going to send Elijah the prophet to you before the great and fearful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with complete destruction. Here on the Mount of Transfiguration, we're, we're told to look back at where the Old Testament left us. It left us with the law of Moses. It left us with Elijah, the great preacher of repentance, that great and powerful miracle worker. In a sense, I think the Lord wants us to, to look at where we would be if the Old Testament is where the story ended. It ended with the law of Moses still in complete effect. The Ten Commandments, the summary of the law of Moses. And Jesus proved throughout his ministry, throughout the previous seven chapters of Mark, that no one, not the Pharisees, not the disciples, not you and not me, have kept that law perfectly. When we look deeply into the law of Moses, it doesn't show us that we can earn salvation for ourselves. It shows us our sin. As Paul says in Romans chapter 3, the law, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by works of the law, for through the law we become aware of sin. That's what we are remem reminded of when we look at Moses. Well, how about Elijah? This, is, this appearance of Elijah is a little more cryptic. The, the disciples didn't understand why he was there and what he was doing, and, and they asked Jesus about it on, on their way back down the mountain. They said, you know, why, why does the law, why does the Old Testament say that Elijah must appear? And Jesus tells them, he, he, he takes the veil off for them. He says, Elijah did come. And the people did what they wanted with him. Elijah did come in the form of John the Baptist, that second great preacher of repentance who came with the powerful sign of baptism. He came to turn the people's hearts to their Lord. And what happened to him? They did what they wanted with him. And what Herod wanted was to have him beheaded, to have him quieted. With Elijah, all that you're left with is a sure sign that the Lord was going to certainly bring about destruction on the land for what they had done to his messenger. We look at back at where the Old Testament ended, at where it would leave us if that's where the story of salvation ended. And it's not a pretty picture. And so that, that tells us something too. Just as the Lord was, was showing the, the disciples, you've got to move on from, from Moses and Elijah. As glorious as they were, you need something even better. So do we. We don't need, as we, as we leave this Mount of Transfiguration, we don't need more laws telling us what to do. We don't need more tips and tricks and hints as to how to live a better life. The law of Moses can never save us. And we don't, need, we don't need just powerful preaching of repentance either. We don't need powerful miracles like Elijah brought because that utterly failed both in Elijah's time and in the time of John the Baptist to actually change the hearts of people, to soften them and lead them from unbelief to faith. We need something better. We need something more powerful. We need someone more powerful. And I think that's a message that God was giving to the people, to his disciples and to us, when suddenly Moses and Elijah disappeared. And only Jesus, Jesus alone, was left on that mountain. We need to see the vista from this, this Mount of Transfiguration to see that, that if we were left with just the Old Testament we would be in a very sad state indeed. 
Imagine that you're on a long road trip and, and just about, just as you're about to cross a, a long stretch of barren highway, you, you find one last stop. But instead of, of putting gas into your car, someone siphons it out. Instead of, instead of filling you up with food and drink for the road ahead, they, they take whatever food and drink that you have with you away from you. Instead of finding a place where you can relieve yourself, you find out that the, the restrooms are all closed down for service. That's kind of what happened to Peter on this Mount of Transfiguration, I think. I think the wind was taken a little bit out of his sails. Was six days earlier, Mark says that this is six days after something. It was six days after God the Father had led uh, Peter to the wonderful confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. For the very first time, the disciples confessed who Jesus really was, his identity as God. And, and now Jesus progressed with them in their education. He told them what he had come to do. He taught them what we call the theology of the cross. He tells them that he must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the experts in the law, be killed, and after three days rise again. And he goes on to say, anyone who will follow after him must likewise take up their own cross and follow him. And you know what Jesus, uh, Peter's reaction to that was? It's the same as yours and mine probably is. No way. Not a chance. There is no need for you, Jesus, to go to the cross to suffer and die. And I certainly am not going to pick up a cross and deny myself and suffer either. You know how Jesus responded to that? He turned around and he called Peter Satan. And he told him to get his head out of you know where. Really, he did. He said, get your mind off of the things of men and place it on the things of God. He dashed Peter's hopes of, of an earthly Messiah, an earthly king who would reign in power and glory. But I, I get the sense that here on this Mount of Transfiguration, Peter thought there might still be hope. Because here on this mountain, Moses and Elijah appear. The cavalry, finally the cavalry's here. Maybe Jesus alone wouldn't be enough to, to reign victoriously on this earth, to overcome his enemies and the, the religious leaders and the enemies of Rome. But now Moses and Elijah are here. You know about Moses and Elijah. At Moses' command, the, the earth opened up and swallowed his enemies. Moses plagued the Pharaoh of Egypt and delivered his people. Elijah? Elijah? Elijah, by his command, led to the slaughter of 900 prophets of Baal. Elijah, when, when King Ahaz sent 50, three groups of 50 soldiers after him, called down fire from heaven to burn them up. Here were the heroes that Jesus needed to help. Here was the cavalry. Now, now Peter wouldn't have to think about that cross and suffering anymore. Now, with the help of Moses and Elijah... Jesus could become the glorious earthly Messiah that Peter and many others had been looking for. But then, poof, Elijah and Moses are gone. And all that Peter is left with is lowly, very real human Jesus. So transfiguration impresses on us today that we don't want to be like Peter. We need to stop being like Peter. What was Peter's problem? Deep down, what was his problem? He wanted to find a shortcut to glory. He didn't want anything to do with this talk about the cross and suffering and self-denial and self-sacrifice. He wanted to take a shortcut to the glory of that awaited. He wanted to stay there in that little slice of heaven on that mountain with Moses and Elijah and Jesus and not have to walk down that mountain into Jerusalem to watch his Savior suffer and die and endure temptation and suffering himself. He wanted a shortcut. That's really nothing new. In a sense, isn't that the original sin, seeking a shortcut to glory? Isn't that what Adam and Eve were led by the devil to do? 
The devil said, don't, don't follow the Lord's way. His way is too difficult. It means obedience and self-denial of something you may want. And so they ate the forbidden fruit because the devil promised this is a shortcut to godly wisdom. They're not alone either. Don't we seek shortcuts to glory? In a sense, isn't every sin really seeking out a shortcut to glory? God says that salvation belongs to him alone. Isn't that why people fabricate false gods in their minds? So that we can steal back a little bit of that glory, so that we can have a little bit of role in our salvation, so that we can avoid that confession that we must come to. If God alone gets the glory, that means that we are nothing but poor, miserable, undeserving sinners. Why don't we praise the name of Jesus to our family and friends more boldly? Isn't it because we'd, we'd like the shortcut to the glory of acceptance rather than that long, dark road of being despised and mocked and in the today's world maybe even canceled out of your career or your social media for boldly proclaiming the name of Jesus? Why do, why do we cohabitate with someone we're not married to? Or if we are married, why do we sneak off into a corner to lust over pictures, illicit pictures that we should not look at. Isn't it because we want a shortcut to the pleasure of marriage without all of the effort and commitment that marriage takes? You know, even as, as Christians, we may, we may think of church as something of a shortcut. Here, no matter what, we can come and we know we will have the forgiveness of sins and we are easily tempted to see that as a license to go out and sin the rest of our lives, the other six days of the week. We're all tempted to find shortcuts. But just like, just like on a road trip, you ever taken a road trip where you've taken a shortcut? You said, I'm not sure, but I think this is a shorter way. And it, it ends up in disaster, right? Well, so does taking shortcuts in our lives of faith. Just ask Adam and Eve how that shortcut ended up for them. Or ask Peter. Remember Peter? A few months later, he's stuck in that courtyard and that servant girl is pestering him. I know you were with him. You sound just like him. And so to get him out, himself out of that situation, he swears up and down, I don't know Jesus. I don't know who you're talking about. Only to leave him a couple hours later weeping bitterly outside of the temple as his Savior is condemned to death. Those shortcuts do not work. That's why we need to remember this transfiguration. We need to stop being like Peter and think there is such a thing as a shortcut to glory. There is no shortcut. The path to glory lays only through the cross both for Jesus and for us. And for us, that means... Embracing our sinfulness, it means honestly confessing it before God. As hideous as it is to, to embrace and to acknowledge, that is what Lent is about. It is about self-denial as well. And I'm not talking about denying yourself chocolate or denying yourself a steak on Fridays. I'm talking about denying self. Denying your will. And asking the Lord to help you do His will. In all humility, bending down on your knees and pleading with God, have mercy on me, a sinner. As backbreaking as that cross is, that's exactly what we need. That's why we need ev Lent every single year. Because when we realize that, that neither the law of Moses nor the, the, the powerful miracles of Elijah can get us to heaven, we, we better understand why it is that we need to see Jesus and Jesus alone. That's what we should focus on as we descend this mountain into the season of Lent. What do we get when we focus on Jesus alone? Isn't that what the voice from heaven tells us? Three things, right? This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. This is my son. It's not going to look like the Son of God 
as we follow Jesus on this long, bitter path to the cross through Lent. It's not going to look like this man has anything to do with God as he is beaten and tortured, arrested and crucified. It's going to look very much like he's been abandoned by God. But in spite of that, we need to understand he is no less than the Son of God. As we confess in the Nicene Creed, he is God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. Through him all things were made. We need to remember that. Because if it's anything less than the Son of God who is obeying the law of Moses in our place, then it's not been kept well enough. If it's anything less than the blood of the Son of God dripping down Calvary's cross, then our sins have not been paid for. If this is not the Son of God that we are following over the next six weeks, it's a waste of time. And so is our Christian faith. This is the Son of God we are following. Whom I love, God says, a voice from heaven. The Greek is actually a bit more nuanced. It says literally, This is the son of mine, the, the beloved one. And and so what the, the Greek is telling us is that God the Father is saying, I don't just love my son, I love him exclusively. He he is the 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 goal of all of my love. And how could he not be? He's perfect. Compared to us, who are anything but perfect. How could God love us? Ever look in the mirror and ask yourself that? How could God love me after what I've done? And yet he does. He does. In spite of what we are and what we've done, God loves us. He loved us so much that he sent the, his beloved son, the one he loved exclusively to this earth, to suffer the death, the hell we deserved in our place. That means... Lent is a very personal thing for us. We cannot view Lent as if it's some dumb movie playing on a TV set that we can ignore and and look on our phones and surf the internet while we're watching it. This is very personal. This is for you. God sent his beloved son for you, his perfect son to take your imperfect place, to suffer hell for you. We can't view Lent from a cold and detached point of view. Lent is about Jesus, but Lent is for sinners. That means Lent is for you and for me. That's why Jesus, that's why God's beloved Son will descend this mountain into the valley of Lent. Finally, listen to him. Listen to him. Stop listening to the law of Moses that just convicts and condemns you to death and hell. Listen to the voice of Jesus that says, I have suffered death and hell for you. Stop listening to the devil as he he, he tempts you to take shortcuts to glory. Listen to Jesus who says, the cross is the only way. But the cross is the one road that leads to glory guaranteed. Stop listening to the world out there that tries to distract you with with all kinds of earthly things. Listen to Jesus who keeps your mind focused on the glory of heaven that awaits. And where do you listen to Jesus? Well, again, that's why we have Lent. That's why we have six extra special services so that we can listen to him. Jesus doesn't speak directly into our hearts. And even if he did, we'd have to be concerned because Jeremiah says our hearts are deceitful above all things and cannot be trusted. You you will not hear Jesus' voice out there in the world because the world is under the control of the evil one, but you will hear Jesus in the Word. And that's above all what we focus on during the season of Lent. In those special Wednesday services, we come out of our warm homes And we come out into the cold and the dark and we come here to listen to the passion history of our Lord. We come here to listen to Jesus speak directly to our hearts and he says some wonderful things. He says things like, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He says, it is finished. 
He says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Those are things that you won't hear from Moses or Elijah. Those are things that you will never hear from the devil, the world, or your own sinful flesh. Those are words from the cross spoken to you as you carry your cross. Words that lead to glory guaranteed. These are the words of Jesus. Let us make every effort this Lent to hear them. So this is transfiguration. This is our last stop before we descend from this mountain into the valley of Lent. Let's not waste this stop. Let's recognize with those disciples that that all the glory of the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah and their, their laws and miracles, they cannot save us. We need something better. Let us not be like Peter seeking out shortcuts to glory. Let us instead focus on Jesus and Jesus alone because his words lead us through this life to the never-ending glory of heaven. In his name, amen. Please stand as we confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We praise you, O Father for the precious gift of your Son and for his glorious transfiguration on the holy mountain. Give us the firm resolve to listen to your Son, the eager readiness to believe his promises, and the joyful willingness to heed his commands. O God and Father, let your Holy Spirit find a dwelling in our poor bodies and transform our weak, sinful lives into the radiance of goodness, purity, and righteousness. Transform our minds, our understanding, our judgments, yes, our whole persons to reflect the mind of Christ. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Look on your church, O Lord, here and in every place, and grant that we and all who bear the name of Christ may daily offer up to you the acceptable sacrifices of repentance, thanksgiving, and loving obedience. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever.
Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Please be seated for our closing hymn number 97.
Once again, good morning. Glad to have you all here. Thank you for uh, bearing through the, the sub-zero temperatures out there. Hope uh, the Lord gives you a safe trip home as well. Uh, always my privilege to proclaim the Word of God to you, especially this morning as we take our last stop before Lent here on the Mount of Transfiguration. We stop, stop seeing the, the glorious parts of the Old Testament because it's not enough for our salvation. We stop acting like Peter and trying to find shortcuts to glory. We stop and we listen to Jesus alone. That's what we will do this Lenten season. May God bless your day and the rest of your week. Amen. 